And I also invited some of my students. So I think one, one student from Myanmar, he has also joined. Uh, I think he is keen to Ong, if I'm pronouncing his right. or her. That's right, that's right. <laughs> Facebook again? Thank you. Sir, आपके कुछ और लोग expected हैं join करने के लिए? The doctor, which all look after students. Yeah, I, I'm not so sure because I, I just sent the link a few minutes ago. So, because I just checked with Sandy and she said I could. So, I just last minute, just five minutes ago, I shared. So, I don't know if somebody got it or not. So, if, if, if I had known earlier, we could have invited more people. I think one more of your student or colleague has joined. Uh, oh, oh, I think is. Absolutely. <laughs> In the name of Allah, the most gracious and the most merciful. Assalamu alaikum, ladies and gentlemen, and good afternoon. This is Tahir Sultan talking on behalf of Pakistan Society of Civil Engineers. A very warm welcome to all our international audience who are present here in the meeting, in the webinar, and those who are present watching this transmission on Facebook. As you know, these are the series of technical lectures which PSCE holds every month for the benefit of young and experienced engineers. And our endeavor is to keep our fraternity abreast and updated with the current knowledge and advancement taking place in various disciplines of civil engineering. Now, before I introduce the speaker to you and the topic, it's my duty to spell out the rules of this webinar as per instructions of Pakistan Engineering Council. Now the rules are the registered participants for CPT points must appear live on web webcam. However, for the ladies, there is an exception. If they wish, they can cover their face while appearing live on webcam. During the lecture, microphone of all the participants except that of speaker shall remain in mute position. There will be a question answer session at the end of the lecture. And it will be the option is for you is that you have to type it in the chat in the chat box. And I will read the questions. And inshallah, our guest speaker will answer your questions. Same is uh, true for our audience on the Facebook. 
Now, today's topic is future proofing the built environment rule of structural engineers. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor to present to you Dr. Naveed Anwar. Today's lecture he's delivering from AIT Bangkok. His brief introduction is, is as follows. He did his undergrads in civil engineering from UET Lahore in 1982 and masters and PhD from AIT Bangkok in 1988 and 2004 respectively. Dr. Naveed Anwar, a structural engineer, is the senior advisor to the president of the Asian Institute of Technology and is the CEO of CSI Bangkok. As an advisor, he is chairing the group responsible for setting up a new school of professional practice at AIT. As the CEO, he is managing the software development for engineering applications. In AIT, he teaches master's and PhD level courses related to structural and earthquake engineering. In over 40 years of professional engagement, Dr. Anwar has the unique opportunity to work in a very broad spectrum of civil structural engineering knowledge cycle. In teaching of graduate programs, postgraduate research supervision, publications, development of software tools and technologies for application, training and capacity building of professional engineers and direct engagement in hundreds of international projects, all of which feeding back into the teaching, research and development. All of, his, all of this is done in a truly international setting spanning over 20 countries. His expertise and interest include finite element, modeling and applications, advanced concrete design, integration of emerging technologies, into structural engineering, a leading position in performance-based design of tall buildings, design and evaluation of bridges, and innovations in building technology. So ladies and gentlemen, this was a very brief uh, uh, introduction of uh, Dr. Anwar. With this, I just hand over the floor to Dr. Anwar. Sir, please start your lecture. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for a great honor for me to, to be able to present to this society. I'm honestly very impressed. I, I'm, I'm actually wasn't aware that we have such an active society in Pakistan, which is actively uh, sort of disseminating knowledge and conducting such events. And when I look at this series of previous uh, talks, it's very, very impressive. I, some of them are my colleagues uh, and, uh, and even students and faculty from Pakistan. Uh, from AIT have also presented there. So I'm really honored and very glad to be able to uh, present today. Let me share my screen. Um, you know, son, you are all set. The screen is all right. Right. Okay, all right. So uh, this topic, as you might see, is a little bit uh, I would say high level topic in the sense that we are not going into deep uh, study of any individual topic or subject, but rather an overview of uh, these aspects of civil and structural engineering, which relate to the, the design, construction, management of built environment, and how can we make it future proof. So let me uh, start with this first sort of statement that I think we all know that humanity has always been fascinated by predictions about the future. And uh, we have been, you know, we have seen people uh, predicting future based on uh, celestial movements and palm reading and so on. So we are always interested to see what's coming next. And uh, those predictions sometimes come true, sometimes they don't. And if you look at the predictions, you will also notice that some of these predictions are paint a picture of a very bleak future. And when they, when they paint the picture of a bleak future, one of the things is obvious in such uh, depictions that the infrastructure is all destroyed, it is in a bad shape. So the future's bleakness and the infrastructure's sort of state are interrelated somehow. So which means that the, the buildings, the bridges, the roads and other things 
they are considered to be part of the future reference. So another, another prediction which paints a bright future, you can also see there's always infrastructure, which is the focus. So when we have a bright future, we have flying cars, we have you know motorways like this, we have tall buildings, we have green, green infrastructure and so on. So both these future predictions or future views, leak or bright, somehow are related to the built environment. And we as civil engineers are part of that process. So that's why to me, future and built environment are very closely linked. Those of you who are old enough uh, or those who, who have followed this book, this was a very, uh, I would say important book written about the future. And it actually set up the whole cultural movement at that time called Future Shock by, by uh, Edwin Doffler. And I read that. Uh, early on and when I was very young and it was it was very fascinating and in fact this is one of the books that has become a, a critical discussion of the future as they develop and people have been comparing the development of the future with the predictions made in this book uh, quite often and they have found that a lot of predictions made by him are now becoming a reality. So future shock as you can see means that the, when the future if we reach there, we always have a kind of un unexpected things that we did not anticipate uh, naturally. And in this book, he argues about the, the there's no permanence. It's ever changing things. Everything is changing very, very quickly. It's transience, it's novelty, diversity, over choice of things. And we have seen it all. And this was written in 70. And, you know, if you go to even a you know, any place, for example, you want to buy anything, there's a whole choice and you are in a difficulty to even select simple uh, utilitarian things. So, which means that now we have to think about how can we do something which will stand the test of time or will be relevant in future. So, future proofing terminology is becoming important on almost every discipline. And, in, and this is also now finding its way to civil engineering. So the first future proofing is, can be defined in many ways, but in one way is that it's the process of anticipating the future, developing methods of minimizing the effects and shocks, stresses of the future events, and including effects of climate change, of course, which is part of the future, which is almost becoming a reality. So this future proofing now is becoming that organizations uh, they, they always look at how they can future-proof their, their, themselves, their products, and so on. So why it has become so important now? And obviously, uh, one is the rapid change, technological change, climate change, globalization, uh, population expansion, demographic, demographic shifts, urbanization, everybody's moving from the rural to urban. You know, urbanization is reaching 60%, 70%. Uh, rate in most countries, economic volatility, we have all these economic crises coming every few years, every eight, 10 years, we have some kind of a bubble burst. Uh, and then we have what induced the, these pan pan pandemics and health crises. So we can see that there is a very rapidly change. These things may, may have happened in the past too, but the rate of happening was quite slow. In fact, if you look at the timeline, the first agricultural revolution was something like 10,000 uh, BC, long time ago, when people moved from you know uh, being a nomad to agricultural society, the second agricultural revolution that changed the way the agriculture worked was in 1700 and 1800s. Start beginning of that, and then after that, suddenly we have a flurry of industrial revolution, first and second and third and fourth and fifth, within a very short span we have this rapidly changing industrial uh, landscape. So you can see that for the first 12,000 years, almost nothing happened and everything was more or less stable. And future, present and past were mostly the same. There wasn't much change expected. But in the last 350 years or 400 years, we have seen so much change that we, have, we are having a revolution every 50 years and not even smaller uh, duration. So this accelerated rate of change is making everybody dizzy, so to speak. So now we are more worried about the future change and anything that we do becomes, um, becomes irrelevant very, very quickly. So that's why the future 
uh, management of the future or future proofing has become important. Those of you, young generation, especially, I don't know how many of you are watching, if you watch this movie's trilogy, Back to the Future, it is actually a very interesting study of the four industrial revolutions because it takes you back and forth in time, step between 1850 and 2015. And even though it's a fictional movie, but it actually captures a lot of those changes very, very you know, appropriately. And those shots that we're talking about, this is these are depicted. So we, we can see now that the change between within that short period, we have had four industrial revolutions. Now, how does it affect the built environment? So built environment is actually a response to population growth, to urbanization, to globalization, and so many other things. And this built environment is actually the backbone of economy and society. The development is measured by the infrastructure development and infrastructure development it sort of spurs the economic development and so on. So they are both inter interlinked. As you can see very well, that whenever we, we see any country developing, the first thing we, we see is the infrastructure, the roads, the building, the bridges, uh, the communication infrastructure and so on. So infrastructure is, is kind of a synonymous, synonymous to economic development. So physical infrastructure, which civil engineers are kind of responsible in a, in a, in a significant manner, is the key. We have seen this from the you know, uh, historical perspective. We have always seen that whenever somebody wants to make a statement, they will build something. And we have seen it over and over and over again. And we can see now that the infrastructure development is becoming more modern, more innovative, and is changing much faster than before. Materials are changing. And the infrastructure is Physical infrastructure, infrastructure supports everything that is done, whether it's mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, communication engineers, they all need physical infrastructure. And that physical infrastructure, obviously, structural engineers have to design. So in a way, if structural engineers do not do their job well, no one else can. And structural, physical infrastructure supports all kinds of other development, and civil and structural engineers are responsible for designing, building, maintaining this infrastructure. So you can see from here, airports and fields and you know everything that you pick is all about that. And now we have this vision of the future for vertical cities where people want to, because of the uh, you know environmental and many considerations, it is seen to be better to have a vertical uh, growth than, than spatial growth. Uh, because you know it saves, saves a lot of space and 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 uh, commuting and and fuel and many things. So there is a, the, the concept for as high as four kilometer high cities have been developed, and some of them, especially in, in Dubai, in Dubai Creek, which is under development now, is one of those projects. This is a very quick view of the development of the tall buildings, for example, and you can see how rapidly this has changed in just a few. To, to the height of the building, these buildings, how it has changed uh, technology, how it has changed in just uh, over 150 years or so. So it started in, in not too far, not, not too long ago. And now you can see that it is rapidly changing, rapidly uh, increasing in terms of the height, in terms of the form, and so on. And most of this development in, in, happened in, in, in the West, especially in US and on the East Coast of US. If you look at the development of these buildings, most of them happened in one region, most of them in New York City area. You will see this development taking place over there. So let me, uh, I will just let it finish. It's about a minute and a half long. So this one Empire State Building, when it was constructed, marked a major milestone in the development of tall buildings and it remained the tallest building in the world for a long time until we had new structural systems coming up and new materials coming up that then surpassed that.
So what is important to see is that after some time, you will see that the ship now happened from America to Asia. And most of the tall buildings, after this time, you will see most of them, the ship shifted to, to Asia. And also from steel, they moved to concrete. Almost every tall building constructed in Asian countries is in concrete. And whereas in the North America, it's in steel. So I will make it a bit faster so we can. So as you can see, all of these buildings are in Asia and in the East, East, Eastern hemispheres. And this is the new one that I was telling you where they combine the concept of the Cato Square Bridge with their all their name. So this will give us a quick perspective of how definitely the technology is changing, how rapidly the engineering is changing, and how rapidly the height of the tallest building has changed from a few hundred meters to more than a thousand meters. So obviously, when we have such rapid development, then we clearly need to make it future-proof. That means we can't build these things for just a few uh, you know, uh, uh, like 40, 50 years, it has to be a long-term endeavor. So these structures, buildings have to remain serviceable, has to have to remain always safe, have to be resilient, which is much larger concept than safety, have to be flexible in terms of uh, uh, change of the use, adaptation, they have to be adaptable with the, with the changing times, with the environmental effects, and sustainability, of course, is the key. And most importantly, they have to be dismantable. They have to be uh, end of life uh, built into the design so that the building reaches its, its, its end of life. It can actually be uh, dismantled properly. So now we will discuss some of these issues in a little bit detail. And if we do not think about future proofing, then we have vulnerability to climate change, high adaptation costs, disruption and downtime, because of the buildings not being available uh, for essential services, missed opportunities, and decreased competitiveness for a lot of businesses. So there's a whole danger if we do not make these structures and these buildings future-proof. So coming now to the third and important part of the discussion, which is the real uh, focus of today's talk is, how can the structural engineering and structural engineers participate or adapt their work or, or modify their work or, or, or consciously include in their work the future-proofing concept. So like I mentioned, civil engineering and structural engineering is the backbone of physical infrastructure development, which means buildings, bridges, tunnels, dams, transmission towers, communication towers, power plants, expressways, industrial plants, everything that you see around us is a structural engineers uh, and civil engineers domain. And so that is, very clear that backbone of physical infrastructure is structural engineering, structural engineering, civil engineering, and physical infrastructure is the backbone of the economy and the economic development. So we are at a very important, we have a very important position in society, whether we recognize it or not. Uh, unfortunately, we ourselves and public does not really recognize that as, 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 as they should. So now what can the structural engineers do? Most important, number one, is to have a resilient design. And resilient design doesn't mean safety or following the code, but it means much broader concept. And we, we will just discuss some of them now. And I'm sure you're already aware of them. Second one is innovative materials and techniques. And third one is also something that we will discuss today, depending on the availability of time, the integration of technology into the, the work that we do, into how we do it, in what we do, Technology is the key because we have these industrial revolutions rapidly happening. So if we don't bring them into our discipline, we are going to miss out. Adaptive design, like I mentioned, whatever we do, it has to be, it should have the ability to change with times, with needs, with the utility. Life cycle analysis, and this is very important. We often miss that because we think about the design and we think about the construction 
when we are designing, but we don't think about 50 or 100 years or so on, during which time this building or the structure will be in use. And that is the real cost that we should be thinking about, but often we are we are concentrate, concentrated or, or forced to concentrate on the construction cost and the design decisions that only affect that at the, probably at the cost of the life cycle cost. So collaborative planning work together with other disciplines. So let's, let, let's go into a little bit more depth of the resilient design now. So resilient design basically means that it has to be robust over a long time and it anticipates the potential impact of climate change and flooding and, and severe weather events, which are coming, as you can see, and, and so on. And we have to design the, the, the structures to withstand natural disasters. Let me just say, repeat the, this um, statement from of our good friend, Ashraf Abibullah, and he always, in his talk, starts with the, the structure engineers help to preserve the past, they protect the present and build the future. So that's, that's what our thinking should be. How can we preserve the past and while we protect the present and build for the future? And that all of it begins with the reduction in the risk for the disaster for built environment. So if you look at the disaster, it actually has, I think you know, three key components. It's the it's a combination of hazard, vulnerability, and exposure. Now, hazard is something that we may not have a lot of control on it. Uh, exposure is, once again, it depends on the uh, use of the structures, on regulations, on many things. The one thing that we, as structural engineers or certain engineers, have a control or have responsibility is about the vulnerability. So inappropriate built environment is one of the key multiplier here because hazard can be managed to some, high, some extent. Some hazard can be, some cannot be. And people and property which is exposed, once again, is a matter of policy and other beyond our control sometimes. But vulnerability and hazard, which combine to be risk, is something that we, we should think about managing. And if we can manage this, then we will have a resilient structures. So as you know, structure is basically a step-wise step -wise integration of materials which made up, make up the cross sections, which make up the members, which make up the structures. So whenever we design or take any decision, it must be spread across all of these four steps or components. So material selection or resilience at material level, at cross section level, at member level, at connection level, at, uh, uh, at their, their interface, and finally at the structure level. So all of these are part of the structure and every decision that we make must carefully be considered at each of, each of these steps, which relate to design, construction, uh, maintenance, and so on. Second component, obviously, is the load effects on the structure, which is external, which is the part of the... So it's, this one actually leads to vulnerability control. And this one is the hazard side. And hazard side could have many components, dead light loads, wind load, soil pressure, seismic load, snow, thermal, temperature change, humidity, creep, shrinkage, and so on. And, and this endless list of these hazards that our structure could be exposed to. And our, our challenge is to make sure that our structure has the ability to withstand or, or counter the effects of these hazards or load effects. So to do that, structural engineering has been evolving over time uh, starting with the intuitive design before the computations, before Galileo, before all those people, when we had the master builder concept, they just knew what to do. And through experience, they have learned it, the tradesmen, and they could all, almost always come up with some solution. And we have seen that some of the great intuitive designs have lasted centuries. And, but they were few in number, and they were done by, you know, rulers or people with large uh, access to resources. Common people did not have that. But after the industrial revolutions started, then a large number of infrastructure needed to be, to, to be built. And there just weren't enough master builders to do that. So engineers have to be uh, trained and constrained by code-based design. They have to be given 
limits. According to one of the, the, the engineers, Hardy Cross, we had to have code-based design so we can prevent people from making big mistakes and also prevent make people from people or uh, for making uh, you know very innovative design. So it's a, it's a control on both ends. But that was not enough because we found that it was completely putting the engineers in a box and that didn't work when the structures that we were dealing with did not follow the, the, the code limits. Codes are not designed, codes are not developed to handle Burj Khalifa's type of structures. They have to be done outside the code. So the performance-based design uh, came up and every other discipline has taken up and now the aspects engineering, civil engineering is also following that. And from that, we went to consequence-based and risk-based design, and from there to resilience-based design. And then now we have the tech assisted solutions. So we are in this ladder of evolution of the structural engineering, and especially seismic design approaches. And this is for earthquake and also now wind is catching up. So basically the, uh, the way that we work is evolving to, to, to meet the needs of the society that is changing so quickly. So code-based design is just not enough in most cases. And now let me talk a little bit about performance-based design because that is related directly to resilience. So in, in performance-based design, hazard and response, they fight directly and fairly to determine vulnerability. That means we don't bring the code, we take the codes out of the equation and we, we, we let the real load effects and real capacity or near real, real performance uh, compare with each other. And this is done by uh, obviously advanced nonlinear analysis, nonlinear dynamic analysis, whatever, to make sure that we do not, we remove all of the factors that we put in the codes and then try to find the real, uh, real, real capacity or real performance of the structure compared with the as real hazard as possible. And this picture actually depicts that very clearly. On one side, we have the material, from material to behavior cross-section, from cross-section we have member behavior, and on the other, other side of the equation is the hazard. And starting from, let's say, earthquake, we're starting from ground motion to response spectrum, and then we try to bring them together at a common meeting point, which is the performance point. So now that which means that by any decision that we made on the left-hand side in the change of material or the cross-section will directly reflect in the performance point shifting. And if there is a change in the hazard on the other side, seismic, earthquake, time, ground motion, response spectrum, it will also show up in the performance point. So that means we can now fine tune the two so that they meet exactly where we want them to meet. So this approach gives us a, large, a very good control over predicting the performance well, so that we can actually design in a more reliable manner. And we can, we can make decisions that can then be evaluated and, and, and sort of uh, compared against between the different designs, because if you just have code-based design, there's nothing, the, the performance isn't explicit. So that's a separate subject we will discuss at the time, but let me move on. So design decisions in this case are explicitly linked to hazard levels and the key performance indicators. So KPIs have to be met and the, design, the, the design decisions have to lead towards KPI. This is common in organization. If you are working and you have a job, you have a, uh, you have a, a TOR, and you have KPIs. So you, have, you are expected to do something and you have to perform uh, you know, uh, in, in, in return. And that's exactly what we expect the structures to do. We have the KPIs and we have the... Uh, so these are the KPIs that we have to, to sort of meet, which will ensure that the structures will perform properly in the future. Stability, strength, deformation, drift, ductility, energy, motion, all of that, and many other KPIs can be added. So just to give you a quick uh, rundown of how this can be done. This is a pushover, simple pushover of a tall building where we can see as the hazard increases, we have the damage in the structure that we can capture. And then we can compare when the damage has exceeded a certain limits and what kind of level of damage is, is acceptable and what level is not acceptable. Similarly, we can do a little bit more by using time history analysis. So we can actually do it in, in a dynamic, nonlinear manner. So we can capture the, the structure's um, you know, performance uh, more appropriately and more accurately 
then push over and other static methods. So the point is that we have the tools and we have the technologies to do that at this point. And we can use these to make, to make the structures more uh, explicitly resilient, so to speak. So what we need is an understanding of all of that. We also need to have an agreement of the stakeholders and we need to have a right information. We also have to have the right tools and guidelines and we have to have the ability to interpret these results and determine the performance properly. And, and this requires a lot of patience because it's, a, it's not the traditional way. So it requires you to, to be for us to, to do the things in, you know, in, in a very detailed manner. So, but once we have that, then we have the ability to now move to the next level from performance-based design, we can move, go, move to the resilience-based design and actually ensure the resilience of not only the structure, but the community that the structure serves. For example, if it's a hospital, we know that if the hospital is damaged, it will actually immobilize the whole community during an earthquake or during a flood or whatever, because you need those essential facilities so their performance, their resilience has to be really very high. So that's why the resilient building in society was formed, council was formed, just like we have the green building council, we also have the resiliency council, and then the two sort of work in, in similar manner to have green buildings, which is environmental, and then resilient buildings, which is disaster resilience. So we need to have structures which are both, they both are green and resilient. So this combination, now is something that is clearly indicated in, in the view of climate change and sustainability. We need both because each is affecting the other. And we cannot relate the performance or damage or loss to the uh, structural indicators. And we can relate that to casualties, downtime, rehab for the rest, to restore the structures and so on. And so we can have more confidence on the structure's performance as well as its, its um, res resilience uh, in, in the longer period of time over the life of the structure and over a range of hazards. So, which now brings us to the last step in this one, which is the future-proof design. So if we have uh, gone through performance-based design, risk consequence, risk-based design, resilience design, then we can achieve or we can move towards the future-proof design because we have the tools and we have the indicators that, that can be used to evaluate or can, that can help to explicitly design something which we can term as future-proof. So if you look at the requirements of future-proof structure, remain assessment, serviceable, safe, resilient, flexible, adaptable, and compare it against various types of uh, design methodologies we have, then we can, you can see clearly that the future safe design uh, will meet all these requirements the best. Whereas the code-based design may meet some of them, but not many of them. So as we go from uh, intuitive to future, future safe or future-based design, we can make, meet the requirements uh, more explicitly. There's a higher chance that we can make those, those requirements. And of course, we can do this through innovative materials, use of dur durable materials, uh, use of uh, sustainable materials, like recycling, uh, adopting new types of composites and concrete, and use of uh, new construction technologies like 3D printing and, and so on. So everything has to come together. It's not only the design. We also have to make sure that we, on the construction side, there is also a development that matches what we are evaluating. So this brings us to a very interesting question, uh, which is the uh, design life. Most people, most engineers, most, most people think automatically that we have a design life of the structure of 50 years, 70 years, 60 years. And if you ask the engineers, can you design my structure for 100 years? Or can you explicitly tell me what is the, the real life of my structure? It's a very hard question to answer. And we don't know what dials we should change to change the design life of the structure. 
And if we, if if some clients and we have had clients who come to us, they say we would like our structure to be designed for 150 years, and then we we sit there, sit there and scratch our heads. How can we do that? Because the code we we have basically code based design that doesn't really give us any indication or any way to evaluate this explicitly. But there are ways to do that. And without going into the detail, if I look at those, we can see that first of all, material selection, is durability, maintenance considerations, safety margins, adaptive design, protective measures, life cycle analysis, and responsive design are part of that. And most importantly, we should design the structure from the beginning to be retrofitted. This is not a word, I invented that word, retrofitability. It actually, if you look, look for it, you might not find it because this is the, the concept that the structure, you, you should anticipate that in future at some point, this structure might need to be retrofitted. And we should have the ability to do that. For example, in bridges, they designed them the bearings to be replaced in future. So that means that the retrofitting of the bridge by replacing the bearing is part of the design. Adaptive design, the same thing. We have to make sure that the design, design can, can adapt to changing life loads, to changing. Many times the buildings are sold from one owner to the other and they, they change the use. Now it is not considered environmentally good to take a building and tear it down because previously it was okay that you buy an old building and client would just uh, blast it and, and tear it down and build a new one. Now the environmental considerations will not let them do that because that will cause an environmental impact. So the, the, the tendency to keep the building adapted, built upon it, retrofit is much more now than before because of the resources that we use to new to make new building are just scarce now. So life cycle analysis is very important. We have to conduct the entire life cycle from the beginning to the end. And if you look at a typical life cycle of a project, it's pretty long. It has like 30, 40 steps in there. And as structural engineers, often we are only looking at three, four of them. We are not looking at the entire project life cycle. And that's where the, the cost saving, the, the durability, the, the future proofing and all of that lies in all of these steps that we can look at, look at them explicitly. Conception, planning, design, construction, operation, end of life. These are the key groups of the uh, design life. And we are mostly considering the design portion. And during that time, we do not pay enough uh, emphasis on the other areas, which actually cost more, both in terms of money and environment. So let's take a look at the basic design life. Let's say it's 50 years, X number of years. And if these numbers are, there, there's no real uh, numerical number. I'm just giving a conceptual idea on how the design life or the, the structure's life can be, can be changed or, or, or enhanced. So we have a basic life. Then if we have better maintenance, the life can be improved because the structure is going to degrade badly without maintenance. If you maintain it, the life will be increased. That is obvious. That's the first step that we could do. Second one is improved durability. Concrete cover is increased, concrete strength may be increased, and you have all the durability consideration. The structure life can be extended by improved durability, durability consideration. Next is increased factor of safety, low stress levels. So which means if you do that, your structure is likely to have a longer life because the stress cycles, fatigue, and other things will not damage the structure as much as otherwise, if it is designed to the extreme. Repair, restore, will be refurbished. And if we do see damage, and if it can be repaired or restored, refurbished, then you can extend the life by another 10, 15, or X number of years. And finally, we also have the retrofit that we can then simply do a complete strengthening and change the entire structure, give it a new life. So all of these steps can change the basic design life to double or triple than the originally conceived. <clears throat> then we have explicit design for extended life, which is, which is considering a little bit more than that to that one. We all even modify the load factors. We modify the hazard levels for the return period of earthquake. Instead of being 450 years or 2,500 years, we consider a longer period. For the wind return period, 
being uh, 1,700 or 1,000 years, we consider 2,500 years. So we change the return periods of the nodes and we, we design for the extended life. <clears throat> but no matter what, there is definitely still going to be an end of life. So we must also design for that as part of the future proofing that when, whenever the structure comes to the end of its life, we should be able to bring it down properly. And that is the design consideration for that one. And I'm just giving some of them because we have uh, more material to cover. So I, I, I can share this presentation with you later, that what are the things that we could do for considering the end of life of structures. Then collaborative planning is very important these days. And we have to work with the client, we have to work with the architects, with the other people, site-specific consultant, geotech. So this is just one example that we have got to make sure that we have the, during this process, we engage more, we have to engage more stakeholders. We cannot do it in isolation because structure is part of a bigger, bigger ecosystem. So if we are going to make some decisions, other people have to also be involved in that decision making and have to participate in that. So last part of the talk is about emerging technologies and structural engineering. And this is another part of the future proofing, not only of the structures, but also our own work. Because if as structural engineers, we, we cannot keep up with the emer emerging technologies or incorporate them into the work, we will be left behind. We'll be lagging behind other disciplines. And we have seen so many, so many times disruptions coming to organizations, to, to disciplines disappearing very quickly. So we have to be we have to be conscious that these emerging technologies should help our work and also help the structures and the built environment that we actually make. So there is a paradigm shift in terms of the computers or the computing these days. In the beginning, when we started using computers, uh, I remember writing programs to automate things we were doing. We were doing something by hand, and we wrote a program to make it faster. So that was the, we were, it was considered very smart that, oh, I can now do it, do it faster. I can do it more, I can do more. First frame analysis program was amazing because it could do the moment distribution or whatever, or a matrix analysis very fast. But now it's not the case. Now we have to develop the process that are based on computing technologies. We have to reverse. We cannot just keep doing the things we were doing earlier and automate them. We have to do things differently because we have automation. And that paradigm shift is what we need to recognize. And purpose of technology should be very clear. Streamlining and automating the process, enhancing communication and collaboration, enabling data-driven decision-making, and empowering innovation and creativity. So that is the, the, the underlying use of technology or technology applications. So these technology or, or software should basically help us do things better in the end. And if you look at that technology applications in our structural design process, and look at some of the technologies, for example, AI, data analytics, virtual reality, IoT, blockchain, robotics, drone, and so on, and we can see that they are quite relevant in some, of, some parts of our work and not relevant in some parts. So this relevance matrix roughly tells us where we can use which technology at this time more effectively. So whenever we are doing any part of our work, we can see, okay, these are the possibilities <clears throat> for using technologies. This is the, the relevance of these technologies in future-proofing the structures. So if we want to ensure serviceability, safety, resilience, flexibility, adaptability, these technologies can also help us or can play some part. So combining our structural design process and the future proof awareness, we can bring in technologies and integrate them into our work with a conscious effort to make the structures future proof. I'll give you a couple of examples from our work in AIT. This is, for example, one work in which we integrated many technologies together, uh, drone, 3D printing, finite element analysis, wind tunnel, uh, many things together to design a, a, a dome for for a large sort of uh, space. Uh, uh, we don't have the time, but I'm just giving you an example where integration of technologies can really help to come up with good solutions. 
BIM is one of the, the technologies that I think none of us can ignore anymore. And unfortunately, structural engineers are slow to adopt. This architects are much ahead of us. Other disciplines, mechanical engineers, MEP engineers, they are ahead of us. In the entire building industry, we are the last ones. Structural engineers are probably lacking behind all of the others, unfortunately. So civil engineers, structural engineers, we need to, to embrace BIM uh, for, as a basis of managing project lifecycle information and everything. And I can give you just one example that BIM actually can integrate a lot of information about the structures, about the infrastructure. And it can more importantly point it to a relevant physical entity. So we can link the information to physical entities. And that's the key that we have the relevance of the data to physical, physical entities. And that makes all the difference. So all the data, all the data sheets, they basically link to something that you can you can you can um, uh, capture you can you can you can think about or you can physically uh, uh, manage. So that's why connecting BIM to our work process is very important. And as you know, those of you who are involved in BIM, they know that the BIM has several dimensions. We used to talk about five D BIM. Now six D, seven D, and up to ten D BIM is already in in development. So we are talking about been for not only shape and drawings, scheduling, estimating, sustainability, maintenance of structure, safety for lean construction, and most importantly for uh, post construction hazards and, and other, other aspects. So everything is now integrated all the way through the life cycle using various dimensions of the bin. At the same time, the level of detail in BIM is also increasing. From level of detail to 100, we are now at a level of detail of 700, which means extremely detailed information is now embedded in BIM models. We were at some point, we were very happy to have a 3D model. That is our level of detail of the structural element. Now you have structural elements, plus reinforcement, plus connection details, plus fabrication, plus all of those issues related to that. So combining the dimensions of BIM and the level of detail in BIM, we almost have unlimited uh, sort of uh, capacity to, ma to manage this information and make use of this, in in this information in everything that we do. And in fact, this is one of the focus of our company, the one that we set up in Bangkok, uh, right now, CSI, CSI Bangkok, looking at looking into BIM and integrating into civil instruction behind. Next one, of course, is AI and, and machine learning. A few years ago, when I used to talk about AI and, and machine learning, people didn't really realize or recognize the significance of this one. But since ChatGPT or since these large segment models, since last November, the world has changed. And when we just, if we don't recognize that, then we are missing something. Because that, everything that we thought about the future is actually here. This last few months, the change, the change of uh, you know adaptation of AI in everything is absolutely mind-boggling. You, I, we cannot even uh, keep track of what's happening. So AI is absolutely now here, finally, in the sense that there have been a couple of times that AI came and went and came and went, but now it seems that now it's finally here. So using AI, we can do a lot of things. For example, we can do quick decision making, estimating. Like for example, normally we have the design process uh, in a step-by-step -step from architect to planability to structure to analysis and so on. But using AI, we can simply jump from the architectural design to code-based design directly, for example, or to performance-based design because we can train our models based on the work that we do. So we can skip all of the work and go directly to the end results and we can predict that. Now, those of you, I'm sure everyone here is familiar with ChatGPT or similar, similar uh, uh, large language model models. So right now as engineers, and I'm sure you have heard about the prompt engineering, the new discipline coming up, self-created, there is no such discipline. People have just started to call themselves prompt engineers and people are making a lot of money 
by writing in their CV that I'm a prop engineer and getting paid. Basically, what it means is how to use, how to interact with AI. So if you have the ability to interact with AI, with the large language models properly, you already have an edge over the others. And as engineers, we definitely need both the ability to create the prompts and also to create these large models for our own discipline so that our work also becomes part of this uh, you know, uh, AI, you can call it evolution or, or whatever you want to call it, but it is definitely something that is absolutely sweeping across every discipline. Things are changing so fast that it's unbelievable. Then we also have the generative design, which is very much related to future proofing as well. And it is the extension of the iterative design, but in a more, more controlled manner, where we combine parametric, generative, and AI into integrated design methodology that by itself finds the right solution for the problem. And this is, uh, once again, architects are way ahead of us. Uh, uh, Zaha Hadid, uh, I think you most might have heard her name, the, the famous architect, uh, uh, unfortunately passed away a few years ago. And she is the architect of most of the buildings in Dubai. So she was really, really uh, you know, front runner in using generative design to, to create her, her structure, her buildings, which were both architecturally and structurally integrated right from the beginning in the form. So in generative design, I'll give you just very quick example of what, what can be done. For example, if you want to design a bridge pier and you want to size the, the cross-section uh, with considering aesthetics and the golden rule of proportion and you want economy and, and form work and everything, you could create a parametric generative model and go through various variations very rapidly through this generative design process until we find the solution that we are looking for. So basically it's a parametric design which looks at all of the variation, realistic variations of parameters until it finds the, the solution that we find acceptable. And we can extend that to, for example, even the reinforcement inside. So as you change the form, the reinforcement also can be adapted and then you can find the quantities and the capacity and everything at each cycle. So the generative design can not only look at the form, but can also look at the page inside at the same time, which means look at the capacity, look at the performance and look at everything so we can complete the entire cycle. So for example, this, this could be used to come up with the most, most beautiful or economical or efficient design of a bridge pier as, as, as a small example. Big data, another one, uh, because everything, as you know, is about data. There's more data now in one day than it was all in history before that. So we, we need to be aware that there is, there is some value in this. Companies are built, businesses are built on using data at this time. And we as structural engineers, civil engineers also need to make use of that for our projects, for our work and our profession. Sensing technologies, once again, it is very, very important that we use sensors uh, effectively in our structures because they provide a lot of opportunity for monitoring of what is going on short term as well as long term. And we could, together with the IoT, we can have a lot of information. Sensors have become so cheap that it's unbelievable. As you know, everyone knows that our, our cell phone has uh, uh, all kinds of sensors, including the acceleration sensors and temperature sensor, humidity, whatever. So it's about 25, 30 sensors are built in, which we could always access for doing a lot of work. Blockchain-based applications, we can connect things to what's happening. We can document them. We can create the ownership. We, you know, so, so blockchain it's itself, big data blockchain themselves have provided us a lot of opportunity to actually manage our work in a very, very controlled manner. And already other businesses are using it. And as engineers, we also can make use of these technologies. Drones, we all are fascinated by the drones and the images created by drones, the models created by drones, they can help us in, in a lot of things. In fact, I was quite surprised that one of our paper that we published a few years ago on using drone for construction management received 
about 10 times more readership than our papers on structural design. It seems that people are much more interested to read about the application of drones to construction than application of structural engineering and performance-based design, for example. So this is an area which everybody wants to use that. 3D printing is related to all the other technologies together. IoT, once again, sensor, sensors, IoT, uh, structural health monitoring, they're all part of the same big equation. And then we have the convergence in terms of the cell phone where we can bring all of these things together because everything that we do, we can connect it or we can either control it or we can uh, bring it back to this device. And we have the smart cities uh, at, on a larger scale where everything converges. So it's a convergence of planning, engineering, technology, management, mobility, engineering, energy, retail, uh, everything. So smart city, the way we look at, you know, different people look at it a different way as actually a combination of everything that, that can bring together because every discipline, every technology has to come together in an integrated manner to create a so-called smart city. So I, I think we have, I don't know how much time do I have. I have a few slides about what we are doing about this and AIT. Uh, let me ask the organizers, uh, how much time do we have? Yeah, I think still you can have for uh, around 45 minutes more, no issues. Oh, I actually made it very fast. So I thought we are running out of time. Okay, all right. So with this, uh, this, uh, this portion, I want to go into slight depth of some of these areas because many ideas we touched upon, but we didn't actually show examples of how it can be done and what is done. So I want to show some of the research done at AIT by our group. Uh, on some of these applications so we can see some examples and then maybe we can see that what we are talking about is not just only talk, but actually it is applicable. So first of all, the design, uh, development and future proofing in AIT, mostly we are working a lot on performance-based design. Risk-based design, release, resilience design, we don't do much work on code-based design, but we do a lot of work on the other part of the design process. So that I just want to emphasize that that's the focus of AIT's current work is on performance-based design, risk-based design, and resilience-based design, and obviously future safe design. Second one is the application of technologies. And we are looking at many, and these are some of the relevance where you see dark green color, that is where we are doing more work, and light green color where we are not doing a lot of work. And we, we hope that we will be doing that in the future. So you can see here a lot of work on virtual reality, mixed reality, augmented reality, data analytics, AI, IoT, drones, some of robotics, and so on. So now I want to give you some examples of some of the thesis, some of the research, some of the projects in this area. So we can now understand how this, this could be relevant uh, or how some of that could be done in our own universities in Pakistan. So once again, the relevance of our work with the future proofing. Uh, so let's see, first of all, uh, this is a uh, thesis done by one of the students using data analytics approach to estimate the efficiency of the structural design of all buildings. Because when we talk about future proofing or all of that, we have to look at efficiency as one of the indicators. So how do you define efficiency? What is an efficiency? And how can we determine efficiency through data? That we, we have collected. So this, this is basically focuses on first of all defining the efficiency parameters and then defining a way to evaluate efficiency and then defining a way to compare the efficiency between various types of structural system and structural members. So this research is quite useful because it's it helps us to explicitly think about data and efficiency and how we can compare two structures in terms of their efficiency in various in various aspects, including uh, you know, climate change and including sustainability. Another uh, uh, thesis, which is by, by Ashish, who's actually joining this uh, uh, talk also, he is looking at the calibration of structural models using measured building response. So that's another area that we try to do a lot of work, that we measure the response of the actual buildings and bring it back to the to the, the to the models of a building and calibrate them 
so that we, because when we create a model, we do the design, we don't know how accurate that is. We only have an idea of what we are doing. But if we can also go back and measure the response of the building in, in use and bring that information back and then to calibrate the models so that the models predict the same response as we measured, that means we have removed the modeling errors in our structure. So modeling assumptions, modeling inaccuracies, those can be removed or minimized by recalibrating the structure based on the measurement of the same structure in operation using sensors. So this is what Ashish did. And we have been connecting this research to some buildings in Philippines where sensors have been installed. And this is done, by the way, in bridges quite a lot. Bridges are the most, you know, the biggest application is in bridges. And a lot of our other colleagues are working also in doing the same thing with bridges. Then another one we did using image-based inspection and monitoring of tall buildings. That means if you just take a picture of a surface or a building, then based on that picture, we should be able to determine where it is cracked and what that crack means. Is it a flexural crack? Is it a shear crack? Is it important? Is it uh, dangerous? It's not. So basically taking images, either through drones or through cameras, we can bring that back images, we can identify the cracks, we can find the crack width, we can find the crack length, we can find the crack, crack direction, crack pattern, number of cracks. And from that, we can start to see whether the structure is deteriorating or not. And once again, as I, as I mentioned, this is related to future proofing in the sense that maintenance and durability and structural uh, health can be, can be measured, can be evaluated without actually going near or measuring. So this is by, by taking pictures from far uh, and using various techniques to basically determine the, uh, the state of the building. Right now, this is, is, is focused on cracks. And then he was able to uh, do that, identify crack, crack with crack angle, uh, determine whether it's a shear crack or it's a flexural crack and so on. So this is uh, in a, another area where you can, be, you can combine the technology of imaging and, and the image analysis uh, with structural performance. Another one is quite important, this thesis on enhancing seismic resilience of non-structural members in buildings. Many times as structural engineers, we are focused on the structural members, the, 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 the safety or the, the uh, performance of the structural members, the beam and beam and column and, and, and so on. But in reality, most of the time, the damage first goes to non-structural elements, walls, uh, partition walls, floors, ceilings, glass panels, and so on. And that damage is actually far more severe to buildings, operations, and occupants than the structure itself. Those of you who have seen the videos from Japan for earthquake, basically it's the thing falling down, the, the, the walls cracking, but the structure is intact, but the building is destroyed. So this thesis is, is, is connected to using the structural information to determine the non-structural damage and link that to resilience and to resilience design and to the, to the buildings, to the recovery of the building and so on. So this is quite an interesting work. In fact, we are connecting that to the analysis and design. So this can be automated to some extent. This is the, the use of AI, artificial neural networks or AI for the analysis of highway overpass bridges and so on. So there are several theses that, that, that we have done uh, looking at the application of AI on various types of structures, bridges, bridge piers, uh, buildings, and so on. Once again, training the networks based on the available data or by generated data. Another one is structural health assessment of post earthquake response to all building. This is a project that we are doing in Philippines where many buildings are being connected together because by law, every building in, in Manila in Philippines must have accelerometers. So accelerometers are attached but their data is not going anywhere. So we are trying to connect that data, extract that data, and take that data, connect it, and network it so we can predict the, the damage to the city uh, after an earthquake. Not only damage, but what is the impact of the, of the 
earthquake even before inspecting because we can correlate it back to the model and so on, like I mentioned, calibration and so on. So this is quite a large initiative. We're trying to work with developers, with the authorities to bring this into operation, but there are many practical considerations which are becoming difficult, but technology wise, we have already completed this solution. So this is the, the, the sort of uh, rock diagram where you have the buildings where we have sensors and they, they, they are triggered, a uh, sensor when there's an event or earthquake, and then we have the, the data collection and so on. And finally, the information goes on a mobile phone to the owners or to the occupants that what happened to the building after an earthquake. Without doing an inspection, we can, we can sort of assess that there's going to be a crack in a shear wall at that floor. So that's the level of detail we are looking for looking at. This is a project we did in Pakistan uh, a few years back with uh, with uh, uh, Al Foundation. Uh, this is Baltic Fort. Those of you who have the have a chance to go there, it's a beautiful place to go. I actually went there myself together with my team, and then we 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 did the drone imaging of the. So the the objective was to determine the seismic uh, vulnerability of this. Um, uh, uh, this old port, and then the drawings are not available and measurement is not possible. So we do the drone, drone imaging to create a drone model. From that, we create a BIM model. From that, we created a SAP model. And from that, we created a finite element model. And then we were able to analyze it. So without taking any, any physical measurement, only using drone imaging and internal scans, we were able to create a, a, a reasonably good structural model that could be used for stress evaluation of this 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 um, this 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 structure. So once again, integrating many technologies together into this one: drone imaging and uh, photogrammetry and uh, BIM and so on. This is another project that I mentioned to you received a lot of interest uh, in terms of the publications in which we tried to monitor the construction uh, through using drones and and compare. The construction progress with the BIM model because if you take a, a drone, drone image of a construction site and you can create from that a 3D model and then you also have a BIM model uh, as, as to be constructed then we can overlay those BIM models and the drone model and then you can find what has been constructed what is discrepancy what is missing and so on so you can actually do a progress uh, monitoring without doing any physical measurement by only using drone imaging. This is difficult in practice because many tall buildings, especially they are covered by these screens during construction inside you cannot access. So it's, it's more suitable for bridges and roads and tunnels and, um, uh, and uh, drainage systems than for buildings. But this is a very valid way of uh, doing construction monitoring, progress monitoring. Then there is this integrated digital delivery system, which is beyond just analysis. And this is the project with Singapore that we are doing. Singapore, Singapore government has a project called COT, Cities of Tomorrow. And one of that is to do, use this digital delivery system. That means everything should be digitally done and delivered. No drawings anywhere in the process, no printed drawings to be, to be signed or delivered, only digital information transfer between all stakeholders right to the construction. And that is this digital, and we are part of that project that we are also developing some tools uh, in that, in that big, pro, big project. So having talked about all of that, we should not forget our own profession because as professionals, structural engineers, mm -hmm. I think uh, we are pretty conservative compared to many other disciplines. And uh, we, when we interact with many people, we realize that our profession also needs to future proof itself so that we don't lose this profession in the future. Although it is very encouraging for us to see that in this year intake in AIT, structural engineering program has the highest number of enrolled students compared to all other disciplines, including all in, in, you know, engineering, non-engineering, uh, combined together. So structural engineering seems to be still of interest to uh, students. So we have a largest number of uh, uh, students enrolled this, this year. But to keep that, we need to embrace new technologies, as I mentioned. Also think about sustainability and resilience, 
lifelong learning, interdisciplinary collaboration. Uh, we have to make sure, you know, when we go to a meeting in a project meeting, we always see that architects or town planners, they lead the meeting. Engineers are left behind. We have to have more input or more say in this process. Adaptable design development, regulation and standard development, public engagement, communication, we lack that a lot. I think we all know that when it comes to public engagement and communication, we lack behind many other disciplines. And obviously ethical considerations, all of that is something that as a profession we should be looking at. And future proofing our own careers, which is an extension of the uh, profession. But once again, continuous learning is key. Technological adaptation, once again, is very important, like I mentioned. A soft skill development, and once again, a weak point in engineers. Our soft skills are not as sharp or as soft as if they should be. And if you look at job requirements, go to the internet and say, what are the top 10 job requirements? You will find soft skills to be top one or two, communication skills to be higher. In fact, I remember one time I, I met somebody who was interviewing engineers and he said, even Einstein, I would not take if the attitude and the soft skills are not good. If they cannot work together in a team, we don't want, even if they're very, very smart. So that's the kind of the uh, attitude uh, these days. Networking is also important, but obviously specialization is still relevant. In Each one of us has to be specialized in some, some area. Sustainability focus in everything that we do, and once again, adaptability. And the last one is quite important, entrepreneurship. Having this business set up mind or creating jobs rather than, than finding jobs, I think structural engineers are pretty good at this one. Many people open their own companies very quickly. I can see this one is here, I'm here. Many of us, we did that when we finished graduation, we started our own business or own companies and, and provide um, uh, employment, employment rather than seek employment. So that entrepreneurship is actually pretty much there, but something that we need to further probably formalize. So these days there's a lot of talk about robots and AI taking over jobs. And there, there is a website that you can go and check whether your discipline will be taken over by AI or robots. It's just a lighter side of the discussion, uh, nothing to be. So if you go there and you say that accountants and auditors, 95, 4% chances that they are, their job will be taken over by AI very soon. So basically this profession, according to that website is doomed. If you look at computer programmers, they have to start running. And that's, that is so true. ChatGPT, Copilot, so many tools have come that simply do the programming almost automatically. And if you are following ChatGPT kind of things now, it can write the program for you even if you have no programming experience. Just define the problem and the program comes out all done, nicely written, pretty good. So programmers are, have to start worrying about their job and their discipline because AI is clearly taking over that. Civil engineers totally safe at this point. According to the website, the civil engineering and structural engineering is still a very little chance that we will lose our job because we have a lot of things that still need human and you know, interaction and so on. But it all depends on if we keep ourselves relevant, like I mentioned before. So with that, let me just conclude uh, the talk today and we, then we will have some time for discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Doxa, for such an enlightening lecture showing us the future face of civil engineering. So now we have some questions on, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you on those who are present in the Zoom webinar, they can type their questions now. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, I have questions on the Facebook. So that I will read it out, Doxa and please answer them. The first question, in fact, there are four questions from Shafiqur Rahman. His first question is, there is a lot of development going on nowadays in 
cloud computing, massive parallel processing, even uh, GPU, CUDA, uh, CUDA, which is CUDA computing is there. Massive data learning by AI system, that is artificial intelligence. What is the future of structural engineer, engineering after five to 10 years? AI may eat their jobs. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, definitely, this is, uh, I already mentioned this one, and this is, you know, this, uh, this is absolutely true that, uh, in fact, let me just uh, give me maybe give me a couple of time, a couple of minutes to answer this question more. Yes, uh, yes, so please take your time. Uh, we yes. have now we have ample of time, we can go up to, let's say, another 30-35 minutes, no issues. Okay. So what, what is surprising to me is that uh, millions of buildings have been designed and millions of beams of, let's say, five meter have been designed of, I don't know how many millions. And we still, as structural engineers, when we are given a beam to design a five meter or 10, seven meter beam, something, we start to do the calculations once again from the beginning, calculate the moment, calculate the reinforcement, and we, we do it as if nobody has done it before. And we keep doing that every single time. And we, we have a few hundred thousand engineers working on similar problems, similar projects, similar buildings, we are, which are identical in so many ways. And still every single time we do them from the scratch and uh, using the same procedure. There is absolutely a need for us to capitalize on this cumulative experience that we have from our entire profession because people have been doing it. Just like everyone, other, every other profession, they are collecting this data, putting it into AI system, like our friend was saying, and then using, utilizing that to assist us. Now, if you look at how this AI should be used, in my personal opinion, it will be a long time before AI-based design will be accepted by authorities or can be used for construction directly because there is a role of engineers, liability, so many other issues come up. So probably the chances that the AI-based or the data-based design will be used as a pilot designs are still very remote. But definitely AI-based design or design based on all of these things, these this sh these should become as tools for us to help. For example, in a if the person is, is experienced, uh, we we kind of develop a design sense, and we know that if this is the the this structure, this is what the outcome should be. That many bars, and if they are not, we know it's wrong. But a young engineer, a fresh engineer, doesn't have that design sense, doesn't have that experience. So for them, x number of bars is number is the same as y number of bars. They have no no sense of the numbers or no sense of the design that, that comes out. But AI systems, well-trained systems can help them just like they help us to spell, to correct our spellings. I myself are very bad at typing. When I type something, I made 10 mistakes in, in five words. So the auto spell check always comes and helps me to correct the spelling. So same way, I think the all the data that we have that we can generate, we can train AI models to help us make better decisions, better choices to make our work faster and help us make, to concentrate on innovation rather than computations. So to relieve us from the tedious work and help us on concentrating more, you know, finding more innovative solutions and looking at the bigger, bigger pictures uh, by delegating some of the things that can be automated through AI. So definitely we will see a lot of cloud computing. Uh, you know, that many computers and companies have already moved, moved their comp computing to cloud and the GPUs are becoming very powerful. Most of the AI is done by GPUs. G GPUs were not designed for this, but now if you look at the, the talks by the Nevada, Nevada company, they are developing these GPUs entirely for AI training. So in a few years, the computers that we will have will be primarily developed just for AI model training. So at that time, uh, we as, as engineering community should start collecting our knowledge so it can be 
here usually through this tool. So I, I think it's going to happen. It's, it's probably not going to be for pilot design, but it's going to be in assisting us in making the right choices in preliminary design, in cross-checking our design, in doing a kind of a, a sanity check on the designs and so on for quick estimation and things like that. So we are, but presently we are working on developing several such models by ourselves. Thank you, Rockstar. We have uh, 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 another question from Shafiq Rahman, and he's asking, I have used both PART and GPT to solve some structural engineering problems, but sometimes they do make mistakes and apologize for that. Do you think such risky technologies are acceptable for structural engineering design without any check when human life is at stake? No, absolutely. I mean, in, in fact, forget about GPT, chat GPT. Even if you use a standard program like SAP or EDAP or NSYS or whatever you're using, it, it says explicitly on the box that the, the software is not responsible for the decisions or the, the results the engineer is. And even those programs which are mathematically correctly based, they make a lot of mistakes. And we, we have seen so much coming, you know, so many problems coming out of that. So engineers in the end have to be responsible for, for, for the work, but whichever tool they use. So ChatGPT is no different. It's a tool, it can help us to start something, but we must verify that the results are correct. And I, I do, I use a lot almost every day, an hour or so, and uh, I have experience, like, like, like a friend is saying, it apologizes, it doesn't, it makes a lot of mistakes, especially in computations. So I would trust it more on the conceptual level on finding the, the frameworks to finding the, 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 the solution uh, procedures and processes rather than solving the actual problem. So it's very good at that. In fact, when I first, uh, my first experience with ChatGPT, I thought that it may not know much about moment curvature curve because that's my you know, area of interest. So I said, you know, I started talking, talking to it about moment curvature curve and I was amazed how much in-depth knowledge it had about moment curvature curve, how it is generated, how it is used and so on. But if you ask it to generate a moment curvature curve of a beam with four bars and something, it won't do that. And if it, it might come up with, with things which are, which are totally junk. So I would, I would think that the computational part of ChatGPT is very, very weak. The conceptual part, the procedural part, part is pretty strong. So that's how I will, and never ever use that for real design. Uh, there's a, there is recently, a very interesting example where a lawyer used ChatGPT to uh, prepare a course for a court, and ChatGPT gave it several references of some previous cases that never existed. It just it just made them up. And when the court the case was presented to a judge, they cross-referenced those cases never existed. So it's not only structural engineers; it's happening to other disciplines also if they use it without verification. Thank you, Doctor. Now, this, this is the third question from uh, Shafiqur Rahman. In PPD and A and D, do we have any way to visualize collapsing building? Many people tried using Blender software using its physics engine. Yes, yes, absolutely. So this is very interesting because uh, when I used to watch my, my, my two sons, which were when they're young, playing these video games, I would be amazed at the graphics of those video games and the collapsing buildings and structures and uh, you know all of that. And I always wondered how come they can show these structures being exploded, destroyed, collapsing, uh, looks looking quite reasonably good without doing any analysis because they are based on physics, right? So the, the, the physical part does not, have the structural failure mechanism built into that. So it assumes a certain pattern of collapse and it can, and there are, there are methods which are very good at predicting collapse. Finite element is not one of them. So because the finite element procedures, nonlinear and all, they are based on the assumption that the elements are connected. And then we, we try to do the, all the analysis 
based on the assumption that elements are connected. But there are different methods which are based on the assumption that elements are not connected. And every element is basically connected to other by explicit links. And those links can be broken. And they can simulate the collapse much better than traditional finite element modeling. So if you're looking for a structural type of uh, collapse uh, visualization, which is very realistic, finite element nonlinear analysis isn't the right tool for that, unless you use a large number of uh, nonlinear links to connect every small thing together and then look at the behavior of those links, then it's possible to, to do that. But still, the ending deformations and the collapse mechanisms are not that, 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 that uh, physically not that correct, that correct. Thank you, Dr. Sir. This is the last question from Shafiq Rahman. Then I will start uh, moving towards the questions that we have got on in our uh, chat box on the Zoom. This is Shafiq Rahman asking, once, uh, once uh, I think it is Ashraf, he just misspelled it. Once Ashraf Habibullah said that design codes should be simple. He referred to 60s and 70s ACI code and said these can still develop safe design today. What is your opinion on this subject? Yes, actually, because we do, like mentioned that in, in, in AIT, our prime work is form space design and comparison of code based design and so on and so forth. So, first of all, we have to look at the, the if you look at any uh, picture of a city uh, from, or you, if you fly over a city, uh, you, you would see that 90, 95% of the buildings are like, four to five stories or less than five, six, seven stories. And very few, except, I mean, I'm excluding Dubai, excluding a few cities, but generally the city center or downtown may have a few tall buildings, but less of the city and most of the suburban area and areas beyond, they are very, very low rise and simple building and simple structures. So the building codes are mostly developed to tackle the design of such structures. And they put a lot of constraints within the use of that building code. So as long as the building structure falls within the constraints of the code development, then the codes can provide a good, reasonably good solution. As soon as we have a deviation of the building's uh, geometry, configuration, or the hazard, then the reliability of the code-based design starts to diminish. For example, quick, uh, quick example is, a small building, you have a three-story building. It's an open frame. There's no, no partition walls. And you just have only columns and beams. For that particular structure, the code-based design will predict the, everything pretty accurately, and there won't be much difference between that design and performance-based design. But add one partition wall in one of the panels on one side. Code-based design now fails to capture that immediately because it doesn't have the capability to model that partition wall properly, doesn't have the capability to determine when it will stiffen, when it will collapse, and how it will affect the torsion, and how it will affect everything else. So even a small variation in the structural plan from the frame, regular frame for which the building codes are developed based on the testing, you will start to find differences in the performance of such, such structure. And we do a lot of work, especially in buildings in Nepal and other places where we try to compare these four story, five story buildings uh, with, with partition walls in the front and open frame and shop houses and what, what not. And we find that mostly the code based design, code based procedures would not be sufficient. They would lead to unsafe buildings. And that's why we have, we see so many uh, collapsed buildings in every earthquake, low rise buildings. Thank you, Dr. Sab. Now I'm switching over to the questions I have received here. The first one is from Rizwan Mirza. He's asking, De developing designs based on past data or existing designs, if I correctly understand the concept, 
do you think that creativity in structural design would take a back seat? Uh, see, once again, like I mentioned, there are, there are two parts to this. This this uh, uh, this is a double edged edged sword, as we call it, AI and all of these tools. On one end, yes, they can uh, provide solutions that seem to be that they will replace, but at the same time, they, if used correctly, they can help us to, to, to elevate our work to the next level we, by delegating some of the, the, some of the traditional work, then concentrating on developing solutions beyond that for which the previous data is only used as a guideline. And to, we are also thinking about uh, training models for AI, not only based on previous data, because they, that may or may not be valid, because we, we may not have good design, because nobody really verified them. And we, if you use a design from the past, how do we know that that is a good example? So how do we know that that design actually is, is, has a good performance? So there is a danger that using the, the existing data may actually lead us in the direction which is not the right one. So what we are thinking is that we should train AI models on properly generated valid designs, uh, which are verified through performance, and then use them as a tool to guide us with the new design. So to me, you see, it's very interesting that uh, when the population, world population was a billion or two billion, people were saying that industrial revolution will take out all the jobs because machines are coming and there'll be no, no, no need for humans anymore. And this was like 100 years ago, 120 years ago. Now we have 8 billion people. And I just saw the news yesterday in America, there's a shortage of people. Everywhere there is a hiring and no people to apply. So with all the industrial revolutions, all the technology, all the robots, all the computer, all the AI, still there are more jobs than people available. So I am personally not worried about anybody losing their job. It's just a matter of changing our job, job direction, our job. Uh, what we do, we just have to adapt and change, find a new way of doing things, then we are still in business. Uh, Dr. Saab, there is uh, another question from Rizwan Mirza. Uh, basically, I think it's a comment and there is a question in that comment itself. So you will understand when I read it. I have seen blunders being committed by young engineers blindly relying on computers. With uh, that's I could not hear you. Could, could, could you please repeat? I cannot hear. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah, I, I was saying this is the question from Rizwan Mirza, and uh, basically it's a comment. But there will be, but there will be a, uh, uh, I think, question in itself. You will understand when I will read it. I have seen blunders being committed by young engineers blindly relying on computers. With increasing encouragement of resorting to computers at our engineering schools, we are gradually shifting our emphasis from the basics to black box type solution models. If you will for me, is it not potentially hazardous? Yes. Uh, this, this one, I fully, I, I mean, I agree with you because we, in, in, when we receive students from in, in a master's program from all over the world, people come here, these are graduate engineers. They have already graduated from good universities in the region. And uh, uh, many times, like you said rightly, they lack the basic understanding of the, the, the structure, the concept of the numbers, the, what it represents. They know that there's, there's a certain uh, uh, analysis result or design result with, a, with seven digits of uh, accuracy. So they mistake it to be correct. So the first thing I always emphasize is the difference between accuracy and correctness. So what people unfortunately see is the accuracy shown by the computer programs, but not the correctness. But what we are looking for is correctness. 
not the accuracy. So this is a, a fine point that that we have got to um, to emphasize to 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 the young engineers. And to me, AI is a solution to exactly this problem because AI is is supposed to provide that that uh, sanity check on the numbers so this such big mistakes cannot go through and i will give you an example uh, we have a, we had a project in philippines and uh, the, the person sent us a model and uh, they were saying that oh the the uh, natural period of the building was very very short now to a young engineer new person a natural period of x let's say 0.3 second 0.7 second they don't know what that may mean right for them it is an output from the computer program so the output was 0.3 seconds fine output was 0.7 second they will believe both of these numbers because they are coming out from the analysis from the model but if it Experienced engineers would know that if it's a seven story or 10 story building, the initial period should be around something. 0 0.7, 0 0.3 will be wrong or too small. So AI has the same role because in AI, we can predict that a building of this type should have a number range between this and this. So if a number comes out to be out of that range, a bell should ring or a warning should be issued that this number doesn't seem to be reasonable because previous experience indicates that this number is not valid for a type of structure that you're, you're designing. Just like when you type it, that, that word and the spelling are incorrect, a red line shows up and it tells you this is the right spelling if you're not experienced in, in good in, in spelling. So to, for me, it's a spell, spell, spell checker. AI is a spell checker for structural engineers we should use it like that, not to write the words for us, but to check the spelling for the words, the work that we are doing. So I think it has a great potential to be that person, that somebody overlooking and guiding and, and just checking the roundness of the numbers rather than, so an analytical tool and AI combined together should work well, in my opinion. Thank you very much, Dr. Saab, for answering all the questions and the lecture. I think uh, we, let me check on Facebook if we have any other questions. No, we don't have. And even here, we don't have any further questions. Yeah. So that's all, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the lecture and the question answer sessions are over. Dr. Saab, I would like to thank you again for delivering such a nice lecture. To, uh, to be very honest with you, when I saw the topic, I was a bit uh, afraid that uh, it's a very difficult topic and uh, will you be able to justify uh, its explanation in just uh, an hour or so, but you did it very well. You explained it in such a simple way that uh, I, I'm pretty sure everybody would have understood what you were trying to explain regarding the future proofing and uh, <clears throat> the future phase of uh, civil uh, engineering. So thank you very much. And before we started the lecture, you uh, expressed your interest in uh, taking part in the activities of Pakistan Society of Civil Engineering. That is uh, very encouraging for us. And uh, uh, as I told you, that we will hold a private meeting with you on Zoom uh, with my uh, with my colleagues in the society, and uh, we will discuss uh, how you can participate and how you can uh, assist PSCE uh, from uh, from Bangkok uh, working there. I'm uh, I'm pretty sure we can find a way and. Uh, you see, and uh, I must thank Rizwan Mirza and uh, who introduced you to us. And uh, we are really uh, thankful to him uh, that he, it was he who gave us the opportunity to today to listen to such a nice lecture. So, uh, 
and uh, so, maybe, maybe in the we have a monthly meeting of Pakistan Society of Civil Engineers. Maybe we can uh, you can join us there uh, through this technology, and maybe we can uh, uh, discuss there also uh, for your input here. And yes. uh, <laughs> anything you want to say further, please do. Yes, please. first of all, I, I, I would really would like to uh, actively participate in these activities. And uh, in fact, we have some ideas on how we can do that. Uh, and I'm, I'm actually, uh, I, I should have known it earlier and should have probably uh, joined earlier. But I think still it's not too late because we would really want our young engineers uh, from Pakistan to, to actively sort of work in many areas. So I, I think it's, it's going to be to to start to providing opportunities for them to to expose in, in work and also actually to work on some of the things that we are doing. So we will find some way through your society to create a mechanism for that. So let me just say a few words about this one. Which actually he's my mentor, and I learned structural engineering from him. So I'm really glad that uh, you know to, to, that he has kindly invited me back to speak here. Uh, we did a, a few projects together. And every time I had some difficult things, I would always go to this one to ask his guidance on that. So I'm really glad that he is now also spearheading this one. So thank you so much, everyone. And uh, uh, I'm really honored that I was able to speak at this uh, particular uh, uh, event. And uh, please feel free to contact me. I, I, will, I will type my email here in the chat. And uh, anyone who wants to reach me, please feel free to, uh, yeah, let me see. So, this one, if you want to say something. I think uh, it was very refreshing uh, and uh, it is indeed an honor. Uh, for the society that uh, such an experienced person like Naveed has spared time for us and uh, his guidance for everyone here is extremely beautiful. Uh, I also thank him from the core of my heart. Thank you, Naveed. <clears throat> thank you so much, everyone. Yeah. Now I would like to speak to our international audience who, I mean, non-Pakistanis or those who are outside Pakistan and have joined us. I feel that I, there is some few people from, I think uh, maybe Bangkok, one is from Nepal, one is, I think some are from Bangladesh. So thank you very much for uh, taking interest in this lecture. And uh, I let me clarify one thing that, uh, the society, Pakistan Society of Civil Engineers, is not limited to limited to Pakistanis. Uh, anybody can join it, and anybody can give his input in it. And uh, uh, you would be one day in place of Dr. Anwar and giving a lecture here. So it's a we are very open. And uh, today, Alhamdulillah, our broadcast is going into the three continents of the world. And we have audience all uh, from these uh, three continents, and uh, the society is getting stronger and stronger uh, with each day passing. So I would request all our uh, international audience here, if they wish, they can join us. And the joining procedure is very clearly specified in our uh, on our website. And still, if you have any difficulty, you can contact uh, our. Uh, coordinating officer, Ms. Sadia Naveed, uh, her, uh, on the email that is given uh, on the website. So this was regarding uh, the, uh, regarding some uh, news about uh, our, uh, my thanks, appreciation for the international audience who were present here. Now, lastly, Dr. Sab, again, thank you very much. Uh, we will, we will, inshallah, your uh, certificate for this lecture and a shield will be sent to you by courier service by our coordinating officer, uh, Sadia, Ms. Sadia Naveed. And uh, some lastly, some announcements. Uh, the next lecture is on 19th August, 
2023, same time, 2 p.m. Pakistan Standard Time. The speaker is Dr. Khalifa Jamiluddin, and the topic is 10 Gs Cargo Transportation Route Project Overview. Uh, the participants today who registered for the CPD, they will they can collect their certificates from 20th July, that is the uh, 20th July onwards, which is from the same lecture. So yeah, certificates you can collect from 20th July onwards from our office, which is 14A1 Block P. Model Town Extension, Lahore, and the person to contact is Ahmad Akram. His uh, cell number is 0347-462-5111. So with this, we have come to the conclusion. And uh, audience, thank you very much for your lively uh, participation. Dr. Saab, again, lastly, thank you very much for such a nice enlightening lecture. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.